A few weeks ago, we discussed the differences between the what of Christmas and the why of Christmas. The what of Christmas is that Christmas story. The what of Christmas is what two Gospels have, have shared with us about the details of what happened. With two audiences in mind, these two writers tell the story to reach those intended people that he writes to. That's what we get with the what of Christmas. And I would probably, uh, probably argue that many people, if not all people in this place, know the what of Christmas. What's interesting, as we discussed a few weeks ago, was the why of Christmas. I mean, if we really think about it, this is such a great story. It talks about men and women who have, who have uh, been interrupted by God. And you, you can't help but imagine if you were in their situation and in their place, asking that question, now why? Have you ever asked God why? You know what is happening, right? But you want to know the why. Because we're so distant, so removed from the actual story taking place and unfolding. We weren't there when Mary and Joseph were visited by an angel or when the innkeeper said there's no room. We have no idea how to imagine what it was like to be one of the shepherds in that field or to be uh, one of the magi, the wise men who were studying the stars and said, that's the one we're going to go after. And because we're so distant, we don't always ask that question, why? And we discussed and we talked about the why of Christmas was what, what all of the Old Testament prophets were pointing to and what all the New Testament writers were referring back to was that it was centered on God's desire to reconcile people to Him. To allow us to answer that question that we need answered in our own hearts. To solve that mystery that we have. To, to wonder what could fill that God-created space in our own hearts and our own minds once again. And what we have seen is that many times this story is, is missed. Many times it's centered around other things, but Hollywood got it right a couple times. Fascinating that the story of, of the Grinch and the story of uh, Charles Dickens' A Christmas Story, or A uh, Christmas Carol, we, we start to uh, see and epitomize everything that's bad about Christmas by using the word Grinch or Scrooge. And although these theological words may not be used, you see in that story of both of those, I almost said people, because I don't know what the Grinch is, what, what critter that thing is. Both of those things, stories, redemption. And that is the why of Christmas. That's, that's the why of Christmas. Now, I want you to imagine with me for just a second. If an alien, okay, here we go. It's one of these, huh? If an alien were to visit our world, our earth, and all they had to go on about what Christmas was about was that famous television rendition, A Christmas Story. If that's all they had to go on, what would they determine? What would they discern Christmas is all about? What would they, what would they think that Christmas was all about? Maybe in one sense they would, they would understand that probably this is, this is a winter thing. This is something about scheming and, and, and getting gifts. Maybe it's something about uh, decorating, or I love this, it's the giving the right hints to get what you want. Remember Ralphie, don't you? What did Ralphie want? The Red Rider, right? 
The Red Ryder BB gun. This is, this is what Ralphie said when he was asked. He said, I want an official Red Ryder carbine action, 200 shot range model air rifle. His teacher, Mrs. Parker, said, ha, you'll shoot your... Ah, so you have seen it, okay. And then Ralphie, as an older adult, is narrating this. This is what he says. Meanwhile, I struggled for the right BB gun hint. You remember that story? Remember that uh, his, his, his desire what overtook him just to get what he wanted. I look around and I think about different instances in my life where I've seen this kind of passion happen. When Lisa and I were first married, we, we lived in, um, our first real job was uh, in Louisiana. Louisiana, um, there was a town called Pineville, strategically named after pine trees. How about that for creativity? It was about 30 miles n south of Monroe, right near uh, Tioga and Ball, uh, Louisiana. And uh, so that's just to help you if you've ever been to Ball or Tioga. Um, it, it, we lived in, in, in this town and known for, um, oh, it was also known for its psychiatric ward, but, you know, that's another story. Uh, it, it, was, it had these pine trees, and, and um, we lived on 213 Reagan Street. Right about 400 yards southwest of us was a creosote plant. And this is the stuff that they coat wood to make it weatherproof, and it had an odor. And so this is just, that I know that doesn't have anything to do with what I'm about to say, so just disregard all that. It was difficult. But we had a dog. The dog was a Cocker Spaniel. And out of the 480 different breeds of dogs in intelligence, Cocker Spaniels were about 502 on that level. I mean, they, they were just not the very most, they weren't very intelligent dogs, I'm telling you, okay? Spanky was this dog's name, and Spanky had a uh, orange soccer ball. And when you squeezed it, it sounded like this. And um, so when Spanky was playing with this toy, all we heard was day night over and over again we just heard that sound over and over again so Lisa and I'd be fairly creative we thought we would take that bowl and we would set it up on our um, nightstand or our dresser really high of course when we took it out of Spanky's mouth Spanky was like following us what are you doing what are you doing I want my ball what are you, what are you doing with my ball I want my ball back can I have my ball back that's my squeaky toy that's my toy not your toy I want my ball back come on and so we're, he's following us, and, and he's getting worried, and we set up really high. And Spanky sat there and just stared at the ball over and over again. Until that became really annoying. It did. I mean, there are times where we just kind of like sit back and, and uh, we're uh, minding our own business and we trip over the dog because the dog is just staring at that ball. He really wanted that ball. And this is how he told us he wanted it. He just stared at it. I mean, we learn how to get what we want. We learn how to give hints. We learn a lot from other people. And I don't know when this happened in Katie's life because I know it happened in all of our lives. But Katie has this desire to watch her own shows. She loves Dora the Explorer, Peppa Pig. Anybody watch Peppa Pig? No, of course not. We do. It's on all the time, Peppa Pig. I know it when it's on. I know what channels it's, it's on. Mickey and... But now, you know, there's a difference when we're watching TV with Katie. Katie will watch the commercials beforehand and not even think anything. Now she's looking at them and she is saying, oh, I want that. I want that. I don't know when that changed. It was just in the last couple of weeks. I want that. I want that. That's what I want. She's not very subtle like Spanky. She's pretty straightforward. She looks at us and says, I want that. I want that. I want that. And this is what we get from 
Ralphie wanting his, coming up with that greatest hint. Spanky wanting his ball. Katie saying, I want that, I want that. Some of the ways that we t say what is on our hearts and our minds of what we want is pretty straightforward. Some are subtle. But in everything that we express is a desire for something else that we don't have. And we put blinders on many times. And we just think, oh, if I could just get that. And we are distracted by everything and anyone else. And as we live this way, our lives tell a story. We tell a story by how we act. We tell a story by um, how we respond and what is, what is our desires of what we want. And the question is, what do other people see about the story that you tell of Christmas? We heard a little bit about the Christmas story of happen what's happening in Ukraine. We hear about the story of Christmas unfolding for the uh, Matthew and Luke Gospels. What's your Christmas story? What's the Christmas story that seizes your heart? That other people see and read? I think God uses uh, a lot of different people to tell us this story, to remind us this story. I mean, this is why we have the Scriptures. Men and women, boys and girls, who didn't always get it right. But their story is told. Their story is recorded. And what we look at is, is how people have interacted with God and how people, men and women and boys and girls, have lived out their lives apart from God or for God. And we see not the detriment of when they made wrong decisions or right decisions, but the underlying thing is we see God's faithfulness over and over and over again in these people's lives and how he interacts with them so that their story is remembered because of how their story interacted with God's story. Isn't that amazing? It's not just your story. It's just not my story. The bigger picture, the story that lasts is the story that interacts with God. I mean, you think about how, if, if somebody shares their, their story about how they came to the Lord, and many times, if, if you would hear uh, uh, about 50 or 60 of these different stories of how people were drawn to the Lord, one of the things that, that gets us, one of the things, at least for me, that, that kind of captures my heart is their dependence and their trust in God. I'm attracted to that. I don't, I'm not attracted to the stories where somebody says, look what I did. Look what I was able to accomplish. I'm always, when it comes to the Christian uh, worldview and how God interacts with people's lives, and in my life personally, would what steals the passion in my heart and, and kind of funnels it towards some excitement is what God is doing. I mean, did you hear what Tammy and Matthew shared? 45 out of 57 children said yes to Jesus. 45 out of 57. Think about the story that they will share down the road. Think about what God has been doing in these young people's lives. Yet, many times like the Christmas story, that's over there. That's back then. And we purposefully disconnect from the real Christmas story. I think you could say it like this. Christmas is not a spectator sport. Christmas is not a spectator sport. Christmas is God showing us that He loves us. 
And I shared with you last week that love that is not shown is love that is not known. I mean, we, we could hear somebody say, I love you, I love you, over and over and over again. But we're always kind of iffy on whether we trust it. And God could have just said, I love you, I love you, and done nothing else. But what God did, how the Christmas story unfolds, is a demonstration of God's love. He had to demonstrate it. Because we know that love that is not shown is love that's not known. And it demands, love that is shown demands a response. Paul says in, in the book of Romans, and God demonstrated his love. God told us his love. God reminded, no, God demonstrated his love that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the Easter story, but the Easter story can't come until we have Christmas. So he uses men and women and their stories. Today, just for a minute, I want to look into Joseph's story. I bet you Joseph was looking for the very perfect wedding. I bet you uh, Joseph was looking for the, uh, the perfect story of him being married to Mary. And, and there were a few things that kind of threw him for a loop. Mary saying that she was pregnant. Now, this is before the angel came to Joseph. First thing I would imagine Joseph would say, well, who's the guy? Oh, it's the Holy Spirit. Now that, how many times have you used the Holy Spirit as an excuse? I mean, like us, we would probably be a little skeptical of this. Joseph hears from the angel, but that didn't stop the interruptions in his life because now Mary was about to give birth and they had to go to Bethlehem. I traveled to Pennsylvania in our car with five and a dog. We were within six inches of each other for about 14, 16 hours. I don't recommend it, okay? Don't recommend it. But Lisa and I, when we were uh, younger, and she, she was pregnant with John, we were in a smaller car, and we had a friend that we were bringing up, and a Cocker Spaniel, by the way. We had a Cocker Spaniel, Buster. There's one thing that is okay, you know, it's bearable about traveling. But having a pregnant wife with you in traveling, that changes everything, okay? It makes it even more common. Here's Joseph having to go to Bethlehem with a pregnant wife. A lot of interruptions, a lot of things. Now, we, let, me, let me illustrate how these interruptions made them feel. I, and and you, you probably have had a lot of interruptions. Some of you welcome interruptions. They give you flavor of life. They, you know, they kind of give you a little bit of, uh, oh, this is just kind of exciting when there's an interruption. Not me. I hate interruptions. Because then I'm always worried if I'm going to get everything I have on my list done. Okay? Hate interruptions changing of plans. But here's how, a little bit of the anxiety. Have you ever experienced a church service where somebody is preaching and somebody in the congregation stood up and interrupted the preacher? Anyone? Okay, imagine being the preacher. How would you feel? All right? Imagine being married to that person or looking up and saying, oh my gosh, that's my mom, that's my dad, and being the child of that person. Imagine the anxiety of that. Or, we don't say this as wedding officiants anymore, but in the wedding, there used to be a part of the wedding where we would say, and if anybody thinks that these two should not be married, speak now or forever hold your peace. Has anybody ever witnessed somebody standing up? What would you think if, if you were the bride and somebody stood up? 
What, do you, what would you think if you were the groom? Maybe you would think, okay, reprieve. Okay, I don't know. I'm just teasing. What would you think if you were the bride's mother and this interruption happened? I mean, we look at interruptions in people's lives and we kind of go across and go, move away from the anxiety and frustration. But these are very real things that were happening in their life. And Joseph had this interruption in his life. But not only does the interruption change the story, it's who in whom we find our trust that changes that story too. Where do we find that comfort in our lives when things don't go as we expect? And this, this is the message of Christmas. This is not only the why of Christmas, of why God sent His Son what God was trying to do through Christmas. But this gives us the opportunity to start to identify, to partake and participate in God's message of salvation and that why of Christmas for ourselves. Because each and every one of us tell a story. And when people watch us, they learn. When people see how we respond, they learn. We tell a story. And one of the things that changes the story is the hero. Is the one who is celebrated, is the one who is elevated as, and I was able to put my trust in that person. And for us in that Christmas story, it's God. People have been very cautious over the centuries of making sure that they did not find themselves moving away from the Christmas, what Christmas is, the why of Christmas. You have Jewish people who have remembered the Shema. The Lord, the Lord God is one. Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Teach this to your children. Tie it around your neck. Write it on the doorposts. Remember this story. Remember the why of why you are the chosen. I am the one who fights your battles. And through the early church, we started to see these catechisms, questions and answers of, of the, they were, the purpose was to help them be reminded of the why, of what God is doing. One of these is the Heidelberg. The very first question in the Heidelberg Confession is this, in what is your only comfort? Now friends, if, if it just said, in what is your comfort? Where do you find your comfort? If that's all we ask for, man, that would probably be an underwhelming kind of question. Because many of us find comfort in many different things. Chocolate, a good book, a cheeseburger. Why is it all about food, you know? Cheesecake, cookies, you know. We find comfort in family and friends. We find comfort being in certain places with familiarity. But the Heidelberg Confession, it goes and says, what is the, your only comfort? And now, it forces us to delineate. Where is our only comfort? And my friends, you can trust that what God said and the message of Christmas and the story that God is wanting to tell and he, through the Christmas that He is the one in whom we can find our only comfort. We will find ourselves striving and missing and doing and decorating. 
we will find ourselves like Katie being very explicit and straightforward saying, that's what I want. Or Spanky just standing there and just looking at it. We'll find ourselves trying to come up with different ways to remind ourselves to hint at what we want. And they will change over and over and over again. Until we find ourselves stepping into that Christmas story and finding our place. Allowing our story to intertwine with God's story. Allowing us to find our place and see the why of Christmas. I guess you could say it like this. God says this is why Christmas happened. But for you, what is your why of Christmas? Why do you celebrate? Our prayer is that we rejoice and find our place in the hands of a God who says, you can trust me. And be carried and encouraged and excited about God's Christmas story for us. Gracious Heavenly Father, would you continue to remind us about your intentions through Christmas? But also, O oh God, for us to be honest with ourselves and ask, so what is the Christmas story for me? Why Christmas for me? And I pray, O oh God, that Christmas no longer becomes something that we watch happen. And then a few days after Christmas, we pack it all up and put it away until the next season. Allow us, O oh God, to be encouraged by your Holy Spirit to trust you. It's in your Son's name that we pray. Amen.